Can the United Nations Security Council agree on a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza? It's rejected the latest text drafted by the US. Other members will present a new one. But how likely is it to pass? And if it does, how would it be enforced? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm James Bayes. The UN Security Council has failed to pass a US-drafted resolution recognising the need for a ceasefire in Gaza. It was the first time the Americans had used such strong language, but it wasn't enough for Russia, China and Algeria. They rejected the text because it didn't demand an immediate ceasefire and because it tied any pause in hostilities to the release of all Israeli captives. The vote marks the Council's latest failure to take action since Israel's war on Gaza began almost six months ago. And it won't be the last vote. Another draft is due to be tabled on Monday, this time with stronger language. But can Council members overcome their entrenched positions and internal politics to reach an agreement? And even if a resolution is passed, will Israel take notice? We'll explore all these issues with our panel of guests in a moment. But first, this report from Alexandra Byers. Once again the UN body responsible for ensuring international peace and security, blocked from taking action by language and politics. Those against. On Friday, Russia and China vetoed a U.S.-drafted Security Council resolution that finally acknowledged the importance of a ceasefire in Gaza. The text was significantly stronger than anything previously tabled by the Americans. But it still fell short of demanding an immediate ceasefire, and tied any pause in fighting to the release of all Israeli captives. Russia called the text hypocritical and criticized it for not holding Israel accountable. I wish to draw attention to the following. The U.S. draft contains an effective green light for Israel to mount a military operation in Rafah. At the very least, the authors tried to make it such that nothing would prevent Western Jerusalem from continuing their brutal cleansing of the south of the Gaza Strip. China accused the U.S. of dodging the most important issue. If the U.S. is serious about a ceasefire, then please vote in favor of the other draft resolution, clearly calling for a ceasefire. The U.S. ambassador said the veto was cynical and petty. Russia and China simply did not want to vote for a resolution that was penned by the United States because it would rather see us fail than to see this council succeed. Washington is Israel's closest ally and has blocked three previous attempts to call for a ceasefire. Algeria's ambassador, the Security Council's only Arab member, reminded his colleagues that if they had passed those earlier resolutions, thousands of lives could have been saved. Six months into Israel's war, more than 32,000 Palestinians, mostly women and children, have been killed. Frustrated by inaction, a majority of the non-permanent members have drafted a separate resolution that demands an immediate and unconditional ceasefire. Another vote is due to be held in the coming days. They agree a ceasefire is long overdue, but the question remains whether anything can be done to overcome the politics at the core of the UN Security Council. The meeting is adjourned. Alexandra Byers, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Let's bring in our panel of guests to discuss this further. Joining us from Maryland is Francis J. Riccardioni, a former U.S. ambassador to Egypt and Turkey, in Cairo, Hussein Haridi. He's a former Egyptian assistant foreign minister and former ambassador. And in Ramallah, Hanan Ashrawi, a former member of the Palestinian Legislative Council. She previously served on the executive committee of the PLO. A very distinguished panel. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so, the UN Security Council vote. 11 votes in favour of the US draft re resolution. Solution. Three against China and Russia, double veto, that's why it didn't go through. And Algeria, significantly, the Arab member of the Security Council, one abstention, Guyana. Hanan, can I ask you your reaction as the Palestinian member of the panel to the Security Council once again failing to reach agreement on the Gaza war? As once again, the US has tried to manipulate this multilateral institution in order to try to pass resolutions in a very insidious, if you want, or uh, a way in which it can pass 
all sorts of positions without having any substance. So there are all sorts of verbal uh, acrobatics, and uh, that is very disingenuous without in any way trying to address the real issues. First, it manages to try to, to condemn Hamas in every possible way, Hamas and other uh, uh, organizations, and it makes sure that it's on record. And, of course, it reiterates the accusations of Hamas as though they are fact. Huh? And then it uh, again talks about uh, the, the UNRWA as though there is investigation and it should be investigated that there are allegations that the members of UNRWA took part in the October uh, 7 attack and so on without by, by creating impressions like that. And it even manages to attack the Houthis. But there isn't a single mention of Israel's war crimes, of Israel's genocide, of Israel's crimes against humanity, of Israel's ongoing use of hunger, food, and, and medicine, and so on, as instruments of war. And it just somehow, in the passive voice, all these, all the humanitarian disaster, all the summit, I mean, it, it's conflict-induced. And somehow the conflict is between what, whom? There's one mention of Palestinians, but everything else is about Hamas, and then parties to the conflict, and all the suffering induced by the conflict. So it evades the real issue. It tries to exonerate Israel completely. It puts on record all the negative things pertaining to whether it is Hamas and other groups, or UNRWA uh, with allegations, or the, even the Houthis, but does not address the issue that it is Israel that is responsible for blocking the uh, crossing points, blocking the food assistance and all other materials from coming to, to Israel, uh, to Palestine. And it is actually Israel that is bombing and shelling and killing and slaughtering the Palestinians and is still ongoing, is doing that constantly. So what? The U.S. wants to have food come in and so that the Israel can kill them while they are well fed? There are different ways to die in Gaza, and certainly Israel has tried all ways possible. Uh, and and that, that's why we find these resolutions, as always, when they are drafted by the U.S., using evasive tactics, avoiding issues, and condemning the different parties without really condemning Israel as the major source or addressing the real causes uh, of what's happening. That's why I think the, the veto in this case was uh, well-deserved. Because historically, the U.S. would, in a sense, manipulate any other resolutions and then try to uh, dilute them and make them meaningless in order to abstain. But it has used so far 48 vetoes uh, uh, in order to uh, ensure Israel's impunity, 48 vetoes against any kind of resolution that would hold Israel accountable. And this is the record. This is the context within which we have to address the American manipulation of the multilateral institutions as a whole. Well, a pretty damning verdict on, on what happened and, and on that resolution from you there. Um, I, I, you are all veterans of international diplomacy, and you know that in UN Security Council resolutions, the precision of language is very important. I have the resolution here. I think it might be worth me just reading the exact words of the key paragraph, which said, the Security Council determines the imperative of an immediate and sustained ceasefire to protect civilians on all sides, and toward that end, unequivocally supports ongoing international diplomatic efforts to secure such a ceasefire in connection with the release of all remaining hostages. Francis, they changed that language in the last 48 hours, and Secretary Blinken, who was already travelling in the region, was already in Cairo, said that shows the US is pushing for a ceasefire. Um, others said it was very deliberately ambiguous, using the words determines the imperative of a ceasefire rather than demands a ceasefire, and directly linking it to uh, the release of those being held captive in Gaza. What do you say to that, Francis? First of all, uh... I, I accept the criticisms that uh, Dr. Ashrawi leveled. She's one of the most admired of the uh, Palestinian leaders, at least in the United States. And I think there's no denying there was a lot of art and uh, what Dr. Ashrawi called acrobatics uh, that is striking in the language. However, uh, I see the substance of it as very, very clear. It would have been very helpful, I think, to 
uh, American and, and other diplomatic efforts, the Qatari and the Egyptian uh, efforts, I'll be interested in Ambassador Haridi's view, uh, had that passed, had at least the Russians and the Chinese uh, abstained uh, and had an explanation, they could well have criticized it in their exclamation for uh, explanation of vote uh, along the lines that Dr. Ashari pointed out, not going far enough, et cetera. Um, but underlying it all, uh, I think it would have helped the diplomacy that is ongoing. And I think it would have helped in the longer run. The Israelis would have hated the Israeli right would have hated it. The Israeli uh, peace camp, such of it as may be left, uh, might well have welcomed it. I don't know. There isn't much left to that peace camp under the uh, current circumstances. Um, but in discrediting the Israeli rejectionists of a two-state solution of the uh, of the Palestinian identity of the Palestinian state, um, uh, along with rejecting uh, and condemning the uh, the rejectionists on the Palestinian side, Hamas and the like, I think it would have set the grounds for some substantial diplomatic advancement. And then if you put into that, that the um, Russians and Chinese at least abstained, what a powerful backing that would have been. And by larding it with all of this language that Dr. Ashwari pointed out was in a way, in a backhanded way, erecting the Israeli... Um, Excuses, the Israeli right wing, the Israeli peace camp rejectionists, uh, all, uh, erecting their excuses to knock them down, uh, it had that resolution passed. So I, I would have seen it as a very useful outcome. And for the first time, the United States backing, even if in an artful way, less direct way than I would have liked, perhaps, um, a call for a, a ceasefire, a, 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 an initial ceasefire deliberately, explicitly to lead to a permanent one. I, would, I thought that would have been useful. Your view on that, Hussein, because if it is linked to the release of those being held captive in Gaza, there are talks going on in Doha, but they could take weeks. They might not go anywhere. And then that means there is no ceasefire, is there? Well, I guess the... Uh... The top priority now for all uh, members of the Security Council, including the United States, as well as the Palestinians and the Arab states, is uh, to have an immediate uh, ceasefire in, in, in Gaza. So this uh, human disaster uh, would come to, to an end. And if I discuss the draft resolution that the United States submitted yesterday, before the Security Council, I would I would uh, analyze it in terms of the successive attempts on the part of the Security Council from October 7, 2023, till yesterday, to adopt a resolution calling for a ceasefire. The wording of the draft resolution yesterday, from an American point of view, I guess was a departure. It was constructive in the sense this is the first time that the United States, before the Security Council, calls for an immediate and sustainable ceasefire. So this is something that we could have built upon. I understand some uh, reservations that were uh, either said by Dr. Ashrawi uh, or by the representatives of Russia and China before the Council yesterday. And I would have preferred, from a diplomatic point of view, and taking into consideration the interests of the uh, innocent civilian Palestinians in the Gaza, in Gaza, for Russia and China to abstain, like Guyana did yesterday. The draft resolution submitted by the United States yesterday garnered uh, 11 votes of support out of 14. Uh, out, out of 15 members on the council. So this is some, a majority that we have to take into account. The only, uh, aside from the two vetoes uh, exercised by China and Russia, the only uh, uh, opposition to the draft resolution came from, from, from Algeria, the only Arab member state on the council. So I, I, I think that uh, yesterday was another 
a reflection of geo international geopolitics and its impact on the workings and the effectiveness of the Security Council dealing with the situations that undermine that undermine international peace and, and, and security. On that point, uh, on that point, Hanan, if I if I can bring in Hanan now on that point, um, the U.S. ambassador said uh, that she felt that this was the reasons by Russia and China acting as they did was deeply, deeply cynical. Said one of the reasons is they would never vote for anything drawn up by the U.S. You agree with what China and Russia did yesterday, but do you agree with her that this is all infected by the big geopolitical divides in the world right now? Look, it's very clearly the manipulation of this uh, multilateral body has always been carried out by uh, the U.S. I told you, uh, 48 vetoes when it comes to Israel uh, have been exercised by the U.S. The manipulation of the language, the discourse, the diction of any kind of resolution has always been by the U.S. So let's not, not start talking about China and Russia politicizing or, or uh, employing all sorts of uh, tricks in order to prevent resolutions. Not at all. Now, the U.S. could have immediately put an end to the war, to the killing, to the slaughter, to the genocide, by just not providing Israel with the weapons and with the funds and with the total uh, blank check in order to carry out what it wants. It could have immediately brought the food into Gaza by the, uh, through the land crossing points by bringing Israel to open Rafah, Karim Abu Salem. There are crossing points that could have brought in the food and prevented the starvation, the, the use of food and medicine and supplies as a means of uh, killing people. Lots of things the U.S. could have done. Instead, it managed to uh, vote uh, to veto several previous resolutions, one after the other, in order to buy Israel time, in order to avoid any kind of resolution that would in any way impede Israel's genocide on the rampage, and then to blame others for politicizing the, the situation. The U.S. has always used the U.N. with all its bodies in order to maintain Israel's impunity, in order to reward Israel. And it's been part of the so-called strategic relationship. And we've, uh, it's been said yeah, openly that the U.S. will never allow any resolution to criticize uh, Israel openly or to use any sanctions against Israel. Note the language. It does not mention Israel. As we say in Arabic, there is something called mabni lil majhul, which is the equivalent of the passive voice in English, the unknown perpetrator. The only known people mentioned in this resolution are Hamas and other uh, organizations, terrorists, terrorists, terrorists forever, and of course, UNRWA as having to investigate uh, and accept uh, uh, independent neutral investigation, and, of course, the Houthis. But Israel comes out, you know, uh, perfectly innocent, as though it has nothing to do with this. Everybody else is condemned, and it is everybody else's responsibility, and all parties must apply uh, international law and international humanitarian law. Even the Palestinian people are mentioned only once, and in the last resolution about the vision of a two-state solution, which is fine, well, and good when they allow Israel to destroy the Palestinian state and to, to carry out genocide and ethnic cleansing and massacres in Palestine. I mean, this is really disingenuous. And I think if we start try to start to pick little things here and there that this might work and we can use and for the first time they mention ceasefire, no. They've mentioned ceasefire in, in before, but they <clears throat> managed to ensure that there is language there in the records, in the annals of this multilateral organization that would not in any way condemn Israel, that would exonerate Israel from all its crimes, and on the contrary, that would put on record things that are not even proven about what, the, uh, what Hamas or others did or even the, the UNRWA and so on. Uh, let, let I, me, I really don't on, like let, such manipulation. 
Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me bring in Francis now, if I can. Francis, um, all the spotlight is on the US ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. You, I know, have had postings to four different uh, countries as a US ambassador. You know the pressures, but she must be under a great deal of pressure here. And I just want to bring in a little bit of my own reporting, because I've been based at the UN for the last 11 years for Al Jazeera. Um, and I've had a number of conversations with her in recent months. And... With me, she sticks to the official US line, but I've been told by a number of senior Security Council diplomats that she's increasingly uncomfortable in her role and uncomfortable with her country's policy, and yet she's the one who has to stick her hand up in veto. If, those, if that reporting is correct, and I can only tell you that's what people are telling me, how difficult must that be? It, it, it certainly is difficult, but she is a professional's professional, and she has uh, uh, an oath of office and uh, a deep uh, professional and personal loyalties uh, to her office and her responsibilities under the Constitution. The, this question leads to uh, follow up with Dr. Ashrawi said. She so wonderfully articulated the Palestinian. Uh, the well-founded Palestinian sense of injustice o over many years. And many Americans, not just American diplomats, who have served in the region under more than understand that, sympathize with it. We've seen it, we've witnessed it, the treatment they've had. Uh, all that, though, I, I, one can't set it aside. It is there. On the Israeli side, there's, there, there's deep sentiments and, and and feelings. I don't mean to equate them. That's not the point. When you're a practitioner and you're trying to find a way forward, you often have to, in some way, choke back uh, dispassionately the very offensive things that you find in the language of a resolution or something and see what you can get that will take you forward to the, the larger goal. Um, in this case, uh, I think the the Israelis have created the Israeli right, the Israeli Likudniks, the Israeli peace rejectionists, the those who explicitly have uh, supported Hamas in order to thwart a two state solution. They have committed a historic blunder in doing what they have done in Gaza. Most of the world now, which before. I will speak of the Western world, at least, and in the United States. There's a reason why the United States relentlessly has vetoed uh, resolutions censuring Israel. That's because of popular sympathies and understanding, even if misplaced, for the right, not just the Israeli state point of view, but the, the Israeli right-wing camp, and less understanding for what the Palestinians have experienced under occupation all this time. This historic strategic blunder of the Netanyahu-led Israeli state in, in committing what the most of the world now, the Western world, is explicitly stating as uh, criminal acts under international law, perhaps even under U.S. law. Look at what Senator Schumer said the other day. He didn't call for a ceasefire. You could criticize what he said for, as not going far enough. But he made a historic speech reflecting a historic change, I believe, in American and Western world public opinion, the Israelis have botched it. The Netanyahu government has thrown away uh, what it has, what Israel has uh, accomplished over generations in getting the sympathy of the world and portraying the Palestinians as Dr. Ashrawi has said, as, as some kind of, uh, you know, terrorists, 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 painting them with a broad brush as, as if all Palestinians or the PLO are, are terrorists. OK. That has been overturned. Francis, Francis, I'd like to take us, because we don't have much time, back to the Security Council, uh, because this resolution didn't pass. But there is another one coming up on Monday. It's a much shorter resolution, and this one demands an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, respected by all parties, leading to a permanent, sustainable ceasefire. This is proposed by eight of the permanent members. Already, China, Russia and France say they'll support it. So they have the votes. Hussein, uh, this means it's down to the US. Will the US veto this or not? Given Secretary Blinken was talking up the idea of a ceasefire and the US supported a ceasefire, and uh, others say he was, those comments it, were a bit of spin, but they're in a tough position now, aren't they? Are they going to vote for that resolution? What do you think, Hussein? 
Well, I, I hope that the Security Council will come to a consensus on the need, on the immediate need of adopting a resolution calling for uh, an immediate uh, and uh, sustained, sustainable ceasefire in, in, in Gaza. And I hope that all the members on the Council, whether permanent members or non-permanent members, will put domestic politics aside and concentrate their efforts uh, and their energies on bringing to an end the Israeli aggression against the Palestinians in, in Gaza. This is, from my personal point of view, the most immediate task now. Uh, if we keep going, uh, if we keep uh, accusing each other, then, uh, then uh, I am afraid that the Security Council would fail uh, to uh, help the Palestinians. We need okay. the Security Council. I want to bring in Hanan uh, for, and, the, for the and, last comment. Hussein, if I could bring in Hanan for the last for the last comment on this, if the US supports mm -hmm. this resolution or abstains, does that really mean anything? Will Israel comply, or what sort of pressure is needed from from Washington? Briefly, if you can. Well, Israel has never complied <clears throat> with any resolution. Name one resolution that Israel has implemented, not a single one. So let's uh, <clears throat> let's not think that we can extract something out of this muddy resolution and get something out of it. This uh, la latest resolution that is to be presented is very clear and very uh, succinct and precise. Immediate ceasefire, which is what millions around the world have been saying, and as your other guests were saying, that there was there is a sea change in public opinion. People are seeing the horrors that are taking place by Israel deliberately and willfully in plain sight. It's genocide, and now this uh, uh, resolution just calls for an immediate ceasefire. It doesn't go all over the place in order to exonerate this or condemn that, and this is the important thing. The U.S. could have done this before. The U.S. could have saved scores of thousands of Palestinian lives. And even from day one, they could have said, OK, let's have uh, all for all in terms of exchange of prisoners. Not everything is, is dependent on the, the hostages that were abducted in October 7th. We have over 9,100 Palestinian prisoners who are hostages by Israel. Israel holds all of Gaza hostage. So in this, oh, the whole Palestinian people, even the West Bank. So in a sense, let's find some sort of action that would say Israel is willing to comply with international law, that there is parity uh, between the sides. And of course, in, in terms of the law, uh, there's no uh, objective parity. And the U.S. should at least once vote for a resolution that is simple and straightforward and that says we must save lives. Not okay. we must try to curtail the damage. Thanks very much to our distinguished panel of guests today, Francis J. Riccardioni, Hussein Haridi and Hanan Ashrawi. Extensive coverage of the war on Gaza continues around the clock on Al Jazeera, and you can find more context and analysis on our website, aljazeera.com. We'd like to hear your views on today's discussion. Go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. We also want any thoughts you have on what we should discuss next time. You'll find us on X2. That's at AJ Inside Story. From me, James Bays, and the whole team here in Doha, stay safe. I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.